Late in the evening, on the 2nd of April 1981, a rumour swept through the Palace of Westminster. Tony Benn was about to challenge Dennis Healy for the deputy leadership of the Labour Party. It must have been two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning, and everybody had a few drinks. And I went to him, I found him in his room, and I, I said, look, Tony, don't do it. You know, we, we don't need this. You won't do yourself any favours because it's divisive and it's in your own interest. It will not do you any good. But Tony Benn was determined. The deputy leadership was one step away from the leadership itself and the challenge was allowed under the new party constitution for which he had fought. Dennis Healy had never faced an election for the deputy leadership. He got it unopposed when Michael Foote became leader uh, at the end of 1980. So he'd never been elected. Uh, there had then been the conference where it was decided that there would be an electoral college, so a candidature then was a natural thing to do. Tony announced that he was going to stand in the wee small hours of the morning while we were debating, I think, one of the British telecommunications bills, and he just went uh, upstairs to the press association at night watch person. Um, and gave them a statement to say that he was going to stand. It's very typical, really, of Tony's idiosyncratic approach to politics. Once he'd announced it was too late to stop him. And, of course, a lot of the Tribune group were very angry, including Neil Kinnock, who also had his eye on the potential leadership in future. I was absolutely furious. Um, I mean, from time to time you're angry in politics in any case, but I was incandescent. It was such a destructive act. Uh, Michael had been elected in November 1980. The party was destabilized by the so-called uh, Limehouse Declaration, the beginnings of the SDP and all the rest of it. And along comes Tony declaring in April 1981 that he was going to be the candidate of the left. And it couldn't be anything but disaster. The Parliamentary Party was in a state of high neurosis uh, at this uh, stage in any event. Uh, the, I think you could almost describe the two years between 81 and 83 as, a, as an institution, a very important political institution, uh, having a, a collective nervous breakdown. In the spring and summer of 1981, the Labour Party organised the People's March for Jobs. Its purpose was to draw attention to the plight of the unemployed under Margaret Thatcher. The demonstrations were the inspiration of Michael Foote. He wanted the marchers to unite the party under his leadership. But instead, Foote and his deputy, Dennis Healy, presided over a party which came close to collapse. The really sad thing about Michael's leadership was that the party split. First of all, it split in that there was the tearing away of the Social Democrats. And secondly, there was the way in which, for example, Ben behaved. Ben, who claimed to be a supporter of Foot. I fear we got it neither way with Michael, and I was wrong because I thought Michael would be a unifier, and he wasn't, though he did his very best. Tony Byrne and Michael Foote were both men of the left. They had been political allies and close friends over the years, but now they became bitter enemies. Foote, desperate for unity, was ready to work with the right. He saw Ben's challenge to Healy as a threat to the party's very survival. He was so enraged by Ben's assault on the deputy leadership that he made a public demand. Challenge me, not Healy. When he stood against uh, Dennis Healy, uh, that was not, in my opinion, that was a rather cowardly act because if he really wanted to make the challenge, if he really thought I was doing the job wrongly and if he thought that he was the chap to do it, well, he should have stood against me and he could have done and that would have settled the issue. If he'd been elected, he would have been able to carry through his policy. He wouldn't have been elected, in my opinion, in any case, but that's the reason, I think, why he didn't stand. Is this a matter of personal combat? Or is it the World Heavyweight Boxing Championship? I uh, accepted nomination to stand for the deputy leadership. 
Why aren't you taking on Mr. Foote? Well, I support him as leader. I supported Michael when he stood against Dennis Healy last November. And the campaign is about issues. What about how to get out of the common market and how to stop American nuclear bases and how to get back to full employment. And there's very wide support, you know, in the country for the policies. Not about personalities at all. This idea challenged me. You know, it's all this approach to politics in terms of personal combat without any regard to what's really at, at stake. So it was... Uh, it was distressing, but it didn't surprise me because, as I honestly believe Michael had been put there by the parliamentary party that would have preferred Dennis Healy in terms of their political sympathies, but they felt that Michael was necessary because of his left credentials to stop the left, and he was performing the function for well, which he'd been elected. The House today because we've got the nationality bill. In an effort to prevent Ben going ahead with his challenge, the party leadership mobilised union bosses, traditionally Labour's power brokers. When he said he was running for deputy leadership, he um, came to my office for lunch. He said he liked lunch in there because I always had good kosher uh, salt beef and egg and onion and latkes. And uh, when he had um, finished, he said, can I have some tea? I said, yes. And uh, the lady who said to my secretary had brought in a loving cup. He gave me a beautiful little mug, which I have at home, which said, don't do it, Tony. Elections are a poison chalice. Did indicate the very strong tradition of fixing. Everything's always fixed in the Labour Party. Don't discuss it, fix it. And I think that's one of the things that's wrong. And uh, the denial of people of the right to participate is something that really characterised the right of the Labour Party. He said, no one's going to ask me as gracefully as this to not run. I said, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to run and take it the mug anyway. <laughs> the People's March for Jobs, to Michael Foote's fury, became a platform for the deputy leadership contest. Ben's strength came from the deep support he attracted from the grassroots of the Labour movement. At the time, it seemed crystal clear to me that we needed a big change. And the only man who offered the big change was Tony Benn. We didn't listen to people who said, don't make a challenge. And the reason we didn't listen was because we profoundly believed that we had to have a big change. Um, and there was no question uh, about that. It was, in our minds, absolutely necessary to take off in a new and different direction. The party was organising marches and rallies against unemployment throughout that period. Uh, all of them became uh, almost a hustings for the deputy leadership. People were excited and enthused. First of all, the idea that they had something to say that mattered. And secondly, that here was a, a senior national politician specifically taking up issues of poverty, of common ownership, of industrial policy, those kind of issues. And it surely was a very exciting time. It is a march for human dignity and against those forces which still try to persuade us that men and women should be crucified on a cross of gold in the name of monetarism and profit and loss. And we will not accept that. I've never forgotten in Wolverhampton uh, where we had this meeting. We all went into the church and the spinners sang in the church and then we came out. And then some fascists turned up and the women there got round the fascists and danced and sang around them and silenced them. With no aggression at all, they just went round and they sang. We shall run, we shall run, we shall it was just tremendously powerful. I mean, you mustn't think that uh, for me, the experience of all these campaigns hasn't kept me going because if you open the newspapers and you tapped every day, you know, it's very discouraging. Then you go to meetings, you feel there's a lot of support and somebody hits you on the shoulder and says, keep at it. It's worth any number of words of praise from the press officer at the Labour Party or a friendly leading article in The Guardian. You know, I mean, that's what keeps you going. It is the feeling that you're trying to reflect what people's needs for work and good homes and health and education and decent pensions and peace and that's what it's all about. I think one example of his innocence, not wickedness, 
is that he said at the time that that sort of election was a healing process. <laughs> now, in fact, as you know, it was the least healing thing. It was tearing the scabs off old wounds, and it was profoundly repulsive to the average elector. In the summer of 1981, rioting broke out in the inner cities. Brixton, Toxteth and Moss Side were badly affected. In the face of social unrest and rising unemployment, Margaret Thatcher's government became vulnerable, but Labour was fixated with the contest for the deputy leadership of the party. Here's unemployment going up and up and up. Here's Mrs Thatcher increasing the rents, increasing the prescription charges, cutting the, the, the money to local councils, cutting student grants, doing horrendous things to the National Health Service. And here's the Labour Party, for six months, obsessed with who is going to be deputy leader. People who look at that said they're not fit to run the country. Despite suffering from a rare nervous condition, Tony Benn took his campaign to the unions that summer of 1981. Union votes were crucial to the success of his campaign, but his appeal was always to the members, bypassing the traditional power structures of the party. We organised a, a series of fringe meetings around most trade union conferences, certainly all the big ones, and uh, they proved to be extremely well attended. Um, and fringe meetings were pretty much unknown at many, uh, if not most, trade unions at that stage. I'll get myself a cup of tea. Uh, I've got a sandwich. I bought it. Uh, question. What I did discover as we went round was that the arguments were very compelling. And the uh, contributions were very important. The things that were said were very important. And I suppose one of the biggest meetings was at the ASTMS conference where Clive Jenkins, who agreed to be photographed like a Roman emperor swimming in a swimming pool and commenting on it. It was the most extraordinary picture. Good morning, Clive. Isn't the platform, in fact, trying to avoid a firm decision on the Tony Benn, uh, Dennis Healy issue? Our first approach was that we felt there should not be an election because the country now is in a the kind of situation it was when Hitler invaded Norway. Only I mean, this time, of course, the, the enemy's inside. At a packed fringe meeting, Tony Benn courted the rank and file. Thanks very much uh, for coming along to this uh, small fringe meeting. Uh, I hope, uh, I hope uh, His aim was to persuade one of the largest unions, the ASTMS, to back him and overturn the official position. You've got to have a socialist perspective. Now, the word socialism is sp sp spat out on the media as if it was a sort of disease. They, they get a picture of somebody, sometimes me, with his hands out and his eyes open. Socialism, they say, and the children are put to bed and mother has a... <laughs> <laughs> Mother has another Ovaltine and, uh, and uh, settles down to her novel from the Boots Library and uh, people hope it'll all go away. But that's not how it's pronounced. It is uh, socialism. It's about trying to construct a society around production for need and not just for profit. Around meeting people's needs. That's what it's about. His improvised oratory won over the union activists. To the fury of the leadership, a ballot forcing the union to back Ben for deputy was carried. I was livid with rage because I thought someone was coming deliberately to undermine uh, the democratically elected union executive and the line it's taking. But he won that conference over in his fringe meetings and I, I, I naturally resented what I thought was a breach of our democratic procedures. Now then, young Frank, how are you then? All right? By contrast to Tony Ben. Dennis Healy chose to woo union barons. To win, he needed the backing of their block votes when the election came in the autumn. All the more opulent looking members here are members of our executive. I know, yes, that's right. I had to work very, very hard going to union conferences, get togethers all over the country, grubbing up votes, and that's never been a, an activity. It's rather like fundraising, which I enjoy, but I have to do, you know. The Dennis Healy I remember from those days is not the avuncular, lovable figure I see around uh, now. It was an old flamethrower. 
always like to look back on the week rather than... And he was the front man, really, a very effective front man, for what was the machine uh, for the establishment, um, in rather desperate conditions. And his campaign really consisted of block votes. I didn't take it for granted at all that I'd win. Uh, I knew it would be very closely balanced. It was a very tense period, but it, it had its amusing side. Now, if the cameras will turn off just for one moment, I'm going to tell you a secret. Put it down. That's right. Thank you. Michael Foot isn't perfect. <laughs> I'm not perfect. Everybody knows that. Even Tony Benn isn't perfect. <laughs> Bloody hell. But despite the occasional amusement, the deputy leadership election rapidly disintegrated no, into trench warfare. Human beings would Overall, it was a nasty period, a nasty campaign, one that reflected no credit on the Labour Party as an open, democratic, comradely organisation, quite the reverse. It showed some of the worst sides of people in politics on the left. The People's March for Jobs became a march for the deputy leadership, the rival factions vying with one another to be the centre of attention. In their midst, the leader, Michael Foote, seemed unable to impose order on his party. Michael, who had not only had the great affection of the party, but it became clear that he wasn't up to being leader. He'd also uh, not fixed anything. Now, uh, you, you can't be a Labour leader unless, to be blunt about it, you're ready to, to fix things, uh, to ensure that um, things don't go wrong, uh, and also to work on Murphy's Law, that everything that can go wrong will go wrong, so you have to plan for those uh, eventualities. Things did go wrong. At rallies in Cardiff and later in Birmingham, Dennis Healy was abused and heckled by supporters of Tony Benn. Several of those demonstrations were wrecked by Tony Benn's candidature because at many of those meetings people would turn up, Tony Benn could claim he wasn't responsible for them, but uh, he'd incited it. They turned up and wrecked the meetings. We had our great demonstration in Cardiff wrecked by a few uh, enraged supporters of Tony Benn who came to it. They came shouting and denouncing Dennis Healy as if he was some kind of traitor which he to the Labour movement, which of course was an absolute outrage for anybody to say. We'd had a rally where we had the anarchists carrying skull and crossbones and the militant carrying the militant tendency stuff. We even had the possidists who thought that, uh, supporting Tony, who thought that socialism would be brought to Britain by being some outer space. I think they were a hangover from his period as Minister of Technology when he was a great technology nerd. And the sight of this on the television created the image of the Labour Party as extremist and divided, which lasted for another 10 years. It's only really just been overcome by Blair's election. 150,000 men and women and... Yes. Hey! Don't... Don't some of you who've been yelling understand you're playing the Tory game when you play that sort of game? One of the things which I'll never forgive Tony was not only accepting the support of these people, but being inappropriately pious about it, saying, I don't believe that speakers should be shouted down, I believe in free speech, but that's nothing to do with me, when he could have, with a single sentence, have told them to leave Dennis Healy alone. Well, I'm not in favour of breaking up public meetings. And uh, I think it's a ludicrous idea to expect somebody to denounce somebody over whom they have no control from another party for what they choose to do. But it was an attempt to make it look as if I was encouraging that, which I was not. Tony Benn's campaign exasperated one of Michael Foote's closest supporters. Tony Benn considers that he has almost a birthright to lead the Labour Party. Now, I don't say that he articulates that in his own mind uh, in such an arrogant way, but in a lot of the ways in which he has conducted it himself, he does give the impression 
that no one else is fit to lead. So much of what he did appears to have been impelled by this idea. Neil Kinnock had made his mark as a firebrand of the left, but many suspected him of harbouring his own leadership ambitions. And in the summer of 1981, he distanced himself from the Ben camp. Where's Tony Ben? Yeah. Oh, he's not good today. Well, he should be. Great. Well, there is, he's, we have him around from time to time. In an article in Tribune, the Labour Party's Journal of the Left, Kinnock attacked Ben for encouraging a personality cult and announced that he would not vote for Ben, but would abstain. We were very angry about it, very, very angry about it, um, because you know, it, it was hoped that Neil and others who professed to be on the left were actually going to cast their votes for Tony Benn, so we felt very, very angry about it. I don't think it was just simply he didn't like Ben. I think Neil had longer-term calculations, and when people of the calibre of Neil and those that want to become leaders of parties and possible prime ministers, they do have a long-term agenda, a long-term strategy, and I think that influenced Neil. Neil's decision not to vote for Tony Benn had a number of consequences. One was that he was hated by the far left. The other was that he was accepted by the moderate left and moderate right. Uh, I don't believe Neil Kinnock would have become leader of the Labour Party had he voted for Tony Benn for deputy. So whilst I'm prepared to believe it was a not heroic, but brave thing to do. It was also a shrewd thing to do. And much to his credit, if you can be brave and shrewd at the same time, that's not bad. On Sunday the 27th of September 1981, the Labour Party gathered at Brighton for its annual conference and the election of deputy leader. And there were crowds, not necessarily of Labour Party members, lining the street between the, uh, the hotel uh, and the conference centre. Uh, and um, it was a national event, uh, uh, the like of which I haven't seen since within the Labour Party. I haven't seen so much attention paid uh, uh, to the goings-on in the Labour Party uh, 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 in the subsequent 14 or 15 uh, years. Inside the conference hall, delegates calculated the odds. It was clear that Tony Benn's grassroots campaign had been effective and that the result, defying earlier predictions, would be no walkover for his rival, Dennis Healy. I remember the excitement. I remember people coming up and saying, uh, you've won, we think you've won. I got uh, declarations of support from some very surprising people who thought I had won. And uh, clearly, I mean, Time magazine had a cover prepared. I must be the only one who has the cover of the Time magazine that never appeared. There was a lot of excitement. As I sat on the platform and waited for the result of the deputy leadership election, I thought to myself, if the polls weren't closed now, I would vote for Healy, and I would get those who were part of my loose grouping of uh, abstainers to do the same. Because I, I wanted at that juncture to make it certain. I didn't even want uh, the possibility of Tony Benn winning uh, to become real. People kept coming in with messages saying, Ben's got it by 2%. Then somebody else would come in with a message saying, Healy's just scraped it. It was the most frenzied atmosphere I've ever known at a Labour Party conference because we knew the vote was tight and people, at least like me, believed that if it had gone the wrong way, the Labour Party could probably not recover. When the ballot was declared, the result could hardly have been closer. The final decision, and I'll say this now, the votes have been counted three times. Tony Benn, 49.574. Dennis Healy, 50.426. Tony Benn had lost by less than one percentage point. Neil Kinnock's very public abstention had proved decisive. Well, delegates, you have heard the result of the elections. Congratulations, Dennis Healy. And I can only hope that we can get on with the business of this party. I won by half an eyebrow, half a hair of an eyebrow. And uh, I think Tony was very upset, but he took it in good part. And uh, I mean, he's always been 
very gentlemanly, decent, silver-tongued, charming chap. It's just this destructive innocence of his which is so disastrous. I can't say that it was a, a disappointment because I never expected to win. And when I look back on it, I thought it was an extraordinarily important event in Labour politics, and I still think that. But Healy had won, and for the right of the party, his victory was a watershed. It was a turning point because the Labour Party had decided to cling by its fingertip nails to reality and sanity. And that made it possible for the Labour Party to be saved. It took a long time for the Labour Party to be saved. But the Labour Party was saved and saved as a major electoral force and a contender for government. Now, where is, uh, is uh, Caroline? Let's... I'm one of that small band of people who believe even now that had Tony Benn become leader of the Labour Party, our fortunes would have been very different. Uh, there would have been a clear uh, uh, opposition uh, to the Thatcher uh, regime that people could understand. But I do think we would have been in a much stronger position today than we subsequently were. Tony Benn put on a brave face in defeat. He claimed a moral victory he had lost by the narrowest of margins in face of the full weight of the party establishment. But in reality, defeat was a devastating blow from which he and the left have not yet recovered. The fortunes of the left receded extremely strongly. Uh, they had run out of momentum. Uh, we then were in the run-up to the 83 election and of course we were reaping the whirlwind of uh, anger and disgust uh, at the what were perceived to be uh, a, a party at war with itself. Neil Kinnock's refusal to support Tony Benn was also a critical moment in his career. At the 1981 conference he put down a marker for the future and alienated many friends on the left. As the conference ended, some of Ben's allies called him a Judas to his face. At the bar um, at uh, the conference hotel was extremely crowded. I mean, you really could not move. Um, and again, someone made a disparaging remark towards Neil. And uh, you know, Neil in immediately lost his temper uh, and started pursuing this person through the crowds. Um, you know, obviously very red-faced. Uh, with with fury, uh, and uh, I think eventually uh, came to blows with him in the uh, uh, in the in the gents at the back. I was attacked in the gents by uh, a young man who, I guess, has never attacked anybody in his life. I've I've never seen him since. I've kept my eye out for him because I'd like to uh, I'd like to apologise to him for what I actually did to him. Um, uh, but uh, it he did got caught up in all the emotions and so on. So he. Uh, um, he rather foolishly attacked me, and it was a, it was a, it was it was more stupid than malicious. Uh, but at the time, it it further defined my view that if people were prepared to get carried away to that extent, then we really were in grim circumstances. And I think the years after that tended to prove that that was right. While Labour slugged it out. Those who defected to the SDP appeared to be on an unstoppable bandwagon. By-election victories followed in quick succession. Roy Jenkins captured Hill Head, a Labour stronghold. And Shirley Williams won Crosby, taking almost two-thirds of the former Labour vote. The move from the kind of bitter, lonely battles in the Labour Party to the extraordinary euphoria and excitement of the SDP was... Uh, dark from light. I mean, it was just a total contrast. And in those first few months, uh, everywhere we went, I mean, thousands of people came to meetings. It was almost impossible to find anybody who wasn't going to vote for the uh, SDP and later for the Alliance. And of course, the by-election results were all phenomenal one after the other. The success of the Social Democrats and Labour's internal divisions focused attention on the leadership of Michael Foote. At the Cenotaph that year, he seemed distracted and unsuitably dressed. 
To some, his manner and appearance at the ceremony came to symbolize his unfitness to be party leader, let alone prime minister. For the first time, he was openly criticized by members of his own party. He turned up in a, what, the donkey jacket, it was like a reefer coat, which was marvelous for a, uh, a parade of miners uh, or a demo with a cap on. <laughs> but it wasn't the sort of thing that a, a Labour leader should wear at, at a cenotaph on Armistice Day. And that, there were things like that which did us a lot of damage. But Michael Foote seemed unaware of the impression he was creating. After it was over, I went back to the foreign office where they have drinks. There was the Queen Mother, and she said to me, that's a lovely warm coat you've got on. I said, yes, you need a coat like that on a day like this. So that was, I had never dreamt that this was going to cause such trouble. Michael Foote became the object of derision and cruel caricature in the press. The suffering inflicted on a gentle and unworldly man was deeply distressing to his friends. It would have been better for Michael Foote if Dennis Healy had become leader of the party. I mean in personal terms, in terms of the pressures upon Michael and the wretched treatment that he got from most quarters. I was caricatured and of course caricatures can be extremely wounding. But there have been quite a lot of people in our politics before me and much more eminent than myself who've been uh, caricatured. Sometimes the caricatures are so fierce that it can uh, destroy them, but sometimes they surmount the caricatures. The contrast of foot with the conservative leader, Margaret Thatcher, became more marked as time passed. In 1982, Argentina's invasion of the Falklands and their recapture transformed her standing in the polls. She was able, after three very unpopular years, when her popularity and her party's popularity fell to a quarter of the electorate, she was able, following the Falklands Philip, to build Thatcherism into a political approach uh, which was appealing to many people for a time. And we, instead of challenging her, were fighting one another uh, on abstract theoretical questions totally irrelevant to the needs of ordinary people. Michael Foote's problems would not go away. Early in 1983, Peter Tatchell stood for Labour in the Bermondsey by-election. Can we rely on your support for Labour in the election on the 24th? You may, do. Michael Foote had condemned Tatchell in the House of Commons after the left-wing activist called for extra-parliamentary action against the Tories. Foote had declared he would never endorse Tatchell as a candidate, but then backed down and allowed him to stand. It was an absolute own girl and self-inflicted wound. Whatever you think of Peter Tatchell, he's a principled man, associated now a lot with gay rights, but at the time trying to bring the Bermondsey Labour Party into line with the thinking and needs of the people in the locality. A terrible thing to do. Yeah. I'm Peter Tatchell, the Labour candidate. I live over on the Rockingham Estate, yeah. and that's why I'm a bit of a rebel. Right. If you live around here and you're working class, you've got to be, don't you? Well, I don't think he ever... I never said, I never said that he would never be a candidate. You know, I, I think I dealt with it fairly well. I'm, I'm sorry that... Uh, Peter Tatchell was injured by what was said originally because especially he behaved very well about it. In many ways, Michael Foote, by denouncing me as a candidate, gave a green light both to the right-wing press and to Labour's political opponents. What he was effectively saying was that I was unfit to be a candidate and that effectively declared open season on me. All the protection or whatever the Labour leadership might have given me was removed and I became fair game for virtually everybody under the sun to have a go. Tatchell's public association with gay rights was a gift to some of his opponents. Peter Tatchell. <laughs> yeah, I know. Pleased to meet you. Posters were displayed uh, in the Bermondsey constituency saying, which queen would you support? and a photograph of the Queen of England and a, a photograph of Peter Tatchell, uh, designed to uh, really appeal and to incite the worst kind of prejudices. The old guard of the Labour Party in Bermondsey 
put up a rival candidate, John O'Grady, a local councillor, whose campaign plumbed the depths. I'll give you a song about Tatchell. Tatchell is a puppet, as pretty as can be. But he must be slow, if he don't know, he can't be our MP. Hooray! Both real... It seemed that some senior members of the party actually wished for a Tatchell defeat. I can remember morning press conferences where I was surrounded by Labour frontbench spokespersons and I was suffering an incredible grilling over issues like my support for the withdrawal of troops from Ireland or for lesbian and gay equality. And is there need for money to be given to the troops out of Well, you're, it's a hypothetical No, it's not, a hy it's not a hypothetical question. It's a question before this committee debate on the council. Do you believe yourself that there is a need for money to be given to the troops out of Yes or no? Will you please ask the question? I will discuss it tomorrow morning when a decision has been made. The point is, Mr. Tasson, you can't give a straight and frank answer to a question, can you? You sidestep every question because you can't give a straight answer, can you? While the right-wing press was absolutely ferociously grilling me, the front bench spokesperson just sat there and did nothing. They didn't come to my aid. They didn't offer any intervention to try and help me at all. I was just left to be grilled non-stop um, by these right-wing hyenas. The result, when it came, was even worse than expected. Peter Tatchell, 7,698. 7, I therefore declare that Simon Henry Ward Hughes has been duly elected to serve as Member of Parliament for the Southwark Bermondsey constituency. And there is, there is tonight's sensational result at Bermondsey. Simon Hughes, Liberal SDP, 17,017. Defeated Bermondsey raised questions about Michael Foote's leadership once more. The Bermondsey by-election was a walking nightmare uh, from beginning to end, and anybody who worked in that uh, by-election, I think, came to the view that uh, the most we could hope for in the general election, which was on the cards two or three months away after that, uh, was Labour's survival as a second party and that we had literally no hope of getting into government. And where has an opposition party ever lost a seat with 20 odd thousand majority at a time when unemployment's going through the roof and at a time, you know, when, when Mrs. Thatcher was screwing the country and here we are in Bermondsey, of all places, losing seats. I mean, that really was the pits. And, you know, I think that's when uh, people thought Michael He's, he's no leader. But as Labour politicians have so often lamented, the party lacks the ruthlessness of the Conservatives in replacing its leaders. Although many felt that Michael Foote should be toppled in favour of Dennis Healy, few were willing to wield the knife. I didn't want to suggest it. Uh, my job was, as deputy leader, to be loyal to him. Uh, the only chap who suggested it was Gerald Kaufman. Uh, and he put it to Michael, and Michael refused. I said to him, Michael, I think you ought to resign as leader of the Labour Party. I think that there are people going away to fight the general election who will not come back if you lead the Labour Party in this general election. And he listened with the courtesy that you would expect from Michael Foote, and he said, I don't think I can do that. I thought it would be a quite unwise step to take, and I think, I still think I was right, although I could well understand that people said, oh, you know, Dennis Healy would have made a better leader of the party in those circumstances than you would, although actually what we did was to cooperate as well we could to try and deal with a desperately difficult situation. On the 9th of May, 1983, Sir, well, Margaret Thatcher surprised surprise the country by calling a general election. You're on the way to victory. <laughs> you going to have any problems with the manifesto today? No, no not at all. Michael Foote was ill-prepared for the campaign without his own manifesto. Right, here we are now. Where's the driver? So, get in. How do you feel about the... He and Dennis Healy hastily summoned colleagues to consider the party's proposals. The Labour Party traditionally had a meeting of shadow cabinet and national executive, which the manifesto had to be thrashed out. And I went to that meeting thinking, oh God, we're going to be here all day and much of the night. Not looking forward to it. Suddenly, to my astonishment, John Golding, the leader of the hard right, proposes that all these documents should be incorporated into a single manifesto. My gut feeling was to get rid of it as quickly as possible, without any argument, without any dispute. Just take 
this uh, suicide note, as uh, Gerald Kaufman described it, the longest suicide note in history, put it there, get it signed, and dispatched as quickly as possible. This was carried virtually without any discussion. And afterwards, I remember saying to Gilding, what, what sort of manifesto is this? And he said to me, this election is going to be fought on Tony Benn's terms, so we might as well thoroughly incriminate him. We can't win this election, so we might as well hang all his policy around his neck. Now this indicates the degree of despair to which the Labour Party had come by then. I was still prepared to try and make a decent manifesto out of it, but harder men than I um, wanted to label it as the Ben election so we'd learn our lesson from disaster. A week later, Michael Foote presented Labour's policies at the morning press conference. Gerald Kaufman's tag, the longest suicide note in history, quickly became common currency. It was a huge document covering everything which the Labour government was going to do, written frankly from, overwhelmingly, the point of view of the hard left of the Labour Party. So, total unilateral uh, nuclear disarmament, immediate total withdrawal from the common market, abolition of the House of Lords, uh, command economy, siege economy, and so on, plan compulsory planning agreements everywhere. That was all there, and much, much more. I know not at all that the party's uh, position was um, going to lose this election. I mean, I no doubt about that at all. And that was precisely because we'd allowed a small group of people to determine the agenda of the party who hadn't the faintest notion what was going on in the world out there and who constructed a whole set of policies that were absolutely nothing to do with the needs of real people. And I won my seat in that 1983 election in a strong Labour area, despite our programme, not because of it. We want it to be read up and down the country, and we believe it puts all these different questions in the proper perspective. If we'd won on uh, that election manifesto, we would have had a much better chance of dealing with these economic problems than we had under Thatcher and the Tory government. So I'm not ashamed of that document and I'm very happy that when discussions of this nature lead people back to look at it. <laughs> what was wrong with that document was that it was a stupid document. It contained a number of extremist things. It contained also utter nonsenses. During the course of the compilation of that document, we only narrowly staved off a proposal that we should have a socialist policy for puppy farms. I kid you not. If the manifesto was a liability, the campaign itself was a disaster. Michael Foote disdained modern electioneering with its gimmicks, its emphasis on sound bites, and the dominance of image. Instead, he entered on an arduous and poorly organized speaking tour of the country. Wherever he went, he carried the baggage of four years of Labour's divisions. It was a hopeless campaign. I have <laughs> memories uh, vividly uh, uh, of uh, the difficulties we were all in. Um, the Labour Party was... Uh, losing votes uh, day after day and support was just sliding away from us and the reality is that we had tested to destruction uh, the confidence and the uh, trust of our supporters <laughs> going down part of my constituency on the top of the campaign bus which was open and I can remember seeing a man who knew the truth of the polls which were devastatingly uh, anticipating a, a huge defeat he knew it we all knew it and yet here was a man who who was giving his very all I mean he was physically at the limit of everything that he could give but he knew he was staring defeat in the face I admired him at that moment but we all knew he was doing the general perception from the outside was that the campaign was bad, very badly run and uh, inept but I have to say that from the inside it was even worse the only relief was that uh, from time to time, led by Jim Innes, who was the uh, broadcasting officer, they got hold of the 
uh, awful uh, Michael Foot tape march uh, and stuck it in the machine and marched around the press office uh, to relieve their tensions. She's going to make a very good member of parliament and of the United States according to their constitution. At the heart of Labour's difficulties was the question of defence. Michael Foote was a lifelong unilateralist, utterly committed to ridding Britain of nuclear weapons. The Labour movement are the real defenders of our country. The Labour movement are the people... But during the campaign, the party's divisions over the issue were soon exposed. Oh, it was terrible. One of the problems is that policy wasn't clear. Policy was often damaging, but not clear. There was one day when three different interpretations of Labour's defence policy were given on the very same day by Michael Foote, by Dennis Healy, and by John Silkin, who was our defence spokesman. It was utterly uncoordinated. It was a shambles. Every time he'd speak up, their polls would go down. It was clearly an unpopular policy, supported by relatively few people, and yet Michael was kept on banging on about it. The only safety for our country, the only defence for our country, the only defence for this country and the other countries, is worldwide disarmament, starting with nuclear disarmament, that's what we've got to see. And so his colleagues were saying, Michael, will you please shut up about it? And he said at one point, he said, I am not going to be leader forever of this party. This is uh, the opportunity that I have to get my message across, and I am not going to lose that opportunity to communicate to the British electorate what I think so strongly about this policy. Now, you have to admire that kind of attitude, but as somebody said in the American context, this was a person who'd rather be right than president. Well, Michael clearly would rather be articulate on unilateral nuclear disarmament than prime minister. Right now, lads, we're going through, we're going through there. Now, if you're in the way, I'm going to walk through here. You can come out of the way. Michael Foote and the left mistrusted opinion polls. Instead, they favoured rallies, demonstrations, and the power of sustained oratory. I would show uh, Footy the uh, opinion polls and talk to them and say, oh, you're on. Said there were a thousand people at my meeting last night. They all cheered. They'd say, yeah. But there are 122,000 outside saying you're crackers. William Hazlitt, an old friend of mine, said, I think, many, many years ago, before there were any such things as polls, he said, the fear of what the public will think prevents the public from thinking at all. And people do use the fear of what they think the polls are going to say from uh, stopping all kind of thought. Margaret Thatcher and the Conservative Party, in direct contrast to Labour, had no qualms about mimicking the razzmatazz of an American political convention, and her supporters played on Michael Foote's more obvious weaknesses. Let's bomb Russia! Let's kick Michael Foote's stick away! We ran a, a very professional campaign. The thing I remember most was cancelling um, the last four days of advertising because um, the, the chairman, Cecil Parkinson, decided there was no need to, to do it since we were so far ahead and so unlikely to, to lose the election. I think they, they were still deeply embedded in a, in, a, in a concept of politics that had long gone by. And they were also, they, they eschewed all modern presentation techniques as gimmicks and misleading the public and so on. Um, they regarded our industry, uh, the advertising industry, and, and for that matter, the public relations industry, as being some kind of mouthpiece of the devil. 
As the campaign progressed, attention focused on Neil Kinnock. Michael Foote's time in office was clearly drawing to its close, and Kinnock was ready to step into the limelight. Even though I was a member of whatever committee it was called that was supposed to meet every day to discuss the ongoing state of the election, I don't think I went to more than four or five of those meetings because I, I after the first couple, I thought, hell, I'm better than the street. And so I uh, got behind the wheel of the car, fixed my own program, and off I went, rampaging around the country. It wasn't self-indulgent. My presence in London would have been completely redundant, as I think most people's was. Much of the election was a preparation for Neil becoming a candidate. Michael thought of Neil as his favourite political son, the great affection between them. And Michael was clearly doing his best to prepare the way for Neil. Uh, key meetings that Michael pulled out at the last moment, messages went that Neil was available. Well, I have no, absolutely no complaint about this. This is just what happened. Neil started his campaign the night before the election result was known uh, by a wonderful speech which appeared on television. He had the good luck of having his count on the Friday morning. He therefore had a meeting, quite unnecessarily in terms of winning votes, on the Thursday evening. It was the meeting that got on all television programmes while we were waiting for the result, and it was a brilliant speech. Margaret Thatcher wins on Thursday. I warn you not to be ordinary. I warn you not to be young. I warn you not to fall ill. And I warn you not to grow old. Now, I had said to one or two very close friends that in a, a particular set of circumstances, if we lost the election, uh, I would have to run. But I frankly hoped those circumstances wouldn't arise. I thought my mind would be made up for me. But on the day of polling, Thursday the 9th of June 1983, not even the most optimistic Labour politician had any hope of victory. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our final press conference. I remember the last press conference. I'm always at the last press conferences of dual election. Um, in Transport House, Mark coming and saying goodbye to us. And because I have a silly sense of humour, saying, I hope on Saturday morning you won't keep me waiting very long. I hope you'll phone straight away to say I'm going to be Home Secretary. And sort of hysterical laughter went round the room. They weren't laughing at my joke. It wasn't a very good joke. Um, they were laughing at the absurdity, the bizarre quality of the suggestion that we might possibly win the general election. And that was the spirit throughout the campaign. Yes. It was a 1983 election. At the beginning uh, of the election period, um, our cry against Margaret Thatcher was that she'd cut and run. By the uh, end of the election, I was uh, secretly uh, praying and regretting that she hadn't cut and run some more, because had that election gone on for another week, uh, we would have come third. There is no doubt about it. Our votes were dissolving like snow in the sunshine. There it is, going blue just about everywhere, sweeping the country. The rural parts of Britain now have gone blue. There are only two Labour seats... The election results confirmed the party's worst fears. Under Michael Foote's leadership, Labour won only 209 seats. Margaret Thatcher increased her majority to 144. A landslide. There was one important consolation. Labour hung on as the main opposition party and beat the SDP Liberal Alliance into second place. I'm not making any comment until we hear the real results, you know. And of course I'll be happy to comment then, and I think that's much the most sensible course for us to take. Do you fear it? I'm so the worst time when I woke up at night was when the actual result came through, and it was a terrible result, even worse than I'd feared or most people had prophesied. And some of my closest friends were defeated at that election, defeated no doubt because of their association with me and uh, so it was a very very bitter moment but it was bitter for the country and for the party as well in my opinion if you uh, as an opposition 
after four years of Conservative government, actually lose 29 seats. If you are down to your lowest total since the 1935 election, if you are down to the lowest proportion per Labour candidate of the popular vote ever, it seems to me that's quite a bad defeat. I think that uh, history will say, and judging Michael Foote, that no, he had no chance whatever of becoming Prime Minister of Britain, of winning a general election, and that his contribution, such as it was, was to prevent the Labour Party from having a still more serious split than in fact took place. Anthony Neil Wedgwood Ben. Labour. 18,055. It was also said of Michael Foote that by the size of his defeat, he ensured that Tony Benn could not succeed him, leaving the way clear for Neil Kinnock, for Benn lost his seat in Bristol, and only an elected MP can stand for the leadership. But after the years of struggle, Benn felt he had no cause for regret. Not one little bit. I would have been utterly ashamed if I had followed the course of Neil Kinnock, given up everything he believed in in order to get the leadership and then at the end, fine, having done so, no believed, nobody believed a word you said. I have no regrets whatever. I made mistakes, but they were mistakes made because I believed what I was saying at the time, not because I was manoeuvring or manipulating for some position for myself. As expected, Neil Kinnock was elected leader of the Labour Party at the conference in October 1983. Kinnock, a self-styled radical, had grasped the torch from his friend and mentor, Michael Foote, also a man of the left. Yet over the years to come, Kinnock would lead his party on a fraught and difficult journey to the right. In his youthful enthusiasm, he'd come to believe that this was the only way out of the political wilderness. But the ultimate prize would never be his. We got together in the evening, and the best way to manifest a sort of victorious joy was to sing. And, uh, and so we sang. Uh, I, suppose, I suppose it's either very British or very Welsh, probably more Welsh, in times of celebration and mourning, at times of disaster and possible triumph, to resort to singing. Mussolini, 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 